Brother Charles Billingsley is our speaker for this session, and I appreciate uh, Charles uh, on many levels. Uh, the School of Preaching here does not have a, uh, a large uh, full-time faculty, uh, but this area is blessed with quite a number of good, solid gospel preachers and teachers that live close enough that they uh, drive over and teach classes, and Charles is one of those, and Charles is a perennial uh, favorite of the students in the school. Uh, he's a man of, uh, of calm demeanor, uh, excellent Bible student, uh, but a man of strong conviction in his presentation and defense of the truth. He was educated uh, at San Jacinto College, South Florida Bible College, and the Preston Road School of Preaching has served uh, congregations in Canada, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Texas, and is presently uh, the preacher and one of the elders at the Las Vegas Trail Congregation of the Lord's Church uh, in Fort Worth. And uh, he has taught in the school here uh, as uh, one of our uh, adjunct faculty members uh, for 12 years. And he and his wife, Connie, have three children. Charles, we're glad you're here today, brother. We appreciate you and your work. And let's give our attention to Brother Billingsley as he addresses the topic, Keeping the Church Pure, with Charles Billingsley. Thank you, Eddie. I appreciate those words. You're very, very kind. I also have a great appreciation for Eddie. Great Bible knowledge, sound gospel preacher, godly man well as Brother Maxie. I love you dearly, Maxie. You've been a great encouragement more than you know. And Phil, I was glad to see him here. We work closely in, uh, in Canada. The topic before us is a very serious topic. It's something that really needs to be thought about and needs to be applied to our hearts and lives and keeping the church pure. In 1 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, the Apostle Paul, and he does this by the authority of apostles. He emphasizes in the 14th chapter, he says, things that I say unto you, the commandments of God that they are to discipline a brother in Christ who's engaged in sexual immorality. Obviously not repenting of that. He's guilty of adultery and he's guilty of incest. And the Apostle Paul emphasizes that they must discipline him for two reasons. One reason is for the saving of his soul. A brother has fallen away. He's fallen from grace. In Galatians 6 and verse 1, if anyone overtake him to trespass, you are spiritual to restore such a one. It's the responsibility of Christians to watch after one another. So beginning in verse 4, the, the Apostle Paul says, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and when you gather yourselves together along with my spirit, with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the last on the day of the Lord Jesus. So you want to save his soul. And the destruction of the flesh has referenced, of course, no physical harm to him individually, but destroying that which is ruling his life. His flesh is ruling. Christ Jesus should rule. Bring him back to the Lord. So that in that last day, he will instead of hearing, depart from me, curse into the eternal fire, he'll hear, enter thou in the joy of the Lord. But another reason that he emphasizes the importance of this discipline is for preserving the purity of the church. In verse 6, he says, your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leavens the whole lump? Purge out the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, since you are unleavened, indeed, or truly unleavened, for Christ, indeed, is our Passover who was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast not with the old leaven, with the leaven of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. And the imagery he's using here is taken from the Old Testament and focusing up, as, as we see in Exodus 12th chapter, upon the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And as you recall, that no leaven was allowed in a house whatsoever, so it not corrupt that bread, not pollute it. And the emphasis here is that the, we to remove the leaven of sin so that the body of Christ will not be polluted. Jesus Christ is our Passover lamb, as John the Baptizer identified Jesus when he says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. He died for our sins. Christians are the unleavened bread. They're those who, who by the sacrifice of Christ, have been cleansed from their sins and made pure by that precious blood. 
The feast represents the Christian life that is lived to the glory of God. As Paul emphasized in Ephesians 4 and verse 1, we're to walk in a way that's worthy of our calling. And the leaven, of course, pictures that sinfulness is within the church. The sinfulness of this man who will not repent. It must be dealt with so that the purity of the church may be maintained. This immoral man must be disciplined so that the, the leaven of sin would not spread through the body. Sin is not stagnant. It has to be dealt with. And so in Old Testament Passover emphasizing the requiring of purging out the, the leaven so the church must purge out sin. Not only ourselves as individuals and we'll deal with our sins but the congregation must keep the church pure. We need to take sinfulness seriously. We must take immorality serious. We must not allow it. And so the emphasis here in our lesson is not so much as a, a discipline for the saving of the soul. It was already dealt with in a very great way, but rather we need to be concerned about maintaining the purity of the church. The church is God's holy people. We need to recognize that. You ever notice how many times when Paul begins his letters, he emphasizes you're saints, you're sanctified, you're called to be saints. We're holy people of God. And we're made holy people of God by Christ Jesus our Lord. And churches therefore need to recognize that. The name Christian itself emphasizes that. But it's even the word church emphasizes that. Those are very important words. The word church, ecclesia, means the called out, the, the assembly. The emphasis is that we're called out of something to something. We're called from darkness, from sin, from unrighteousness, from holiness. To be God's only people who live in righteousness and walk in the way of truth. We must preserve the purity of the church. The name Christian is a name, by the way, that God has given us in Acts 11, verse 26. And it means that we're of Christ. We belong to Christ. We're, we're His disciples. We're identified with Him. And therefore, we must not misrepresent Christ. And we're not just continuing to imitate the world and follow the ways of Satan. But rather, as Paul says in Romans 8, verse 29, we're to conform to the image of Christ. We're to keep the church pure. Because we've been washed by the blood of the sacred Son of God, by His cleansing blood. In Revelation 1, latter part of verse 5, it emphasizes with His blood that we're cleansed. In Ephesians 1 and verse 7, Paul says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. In 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, verse 11, and Paul actually emphasizes that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified. That's no longer characteristic of you or should be characteristic of you. Thus cleansed, we're to strive to keep ourselves pure from sin. We're to be holy people of God. Peter gives a warning in 2 Peter 2, verse 20 through 22, when he says, For after we have escaped the pollutions of the world by the knowledge of Jesus Christ, we're not to go back and defile ourselves again, to be caught and entangled in that sin again. For it had been better for us not to know of way of righteousness and after knowing it, to turn from those holy commandments that delivered into us. And then he uses some graphic illustrations. He says, it's become true of you. The Proverbs say, the dog that has vomit, he goes back to eating it. Can you imagine regurgitating that corruption and going back and eating it? That's a filthy picture. That's the child of God who goes back to the way of the world. Amen. Or the sow that was washed going back to the watering in the filth of the mire. That must not be true of children of God. We must walk in the ways of righteousness. And we're warned by inspiration not to love the things of the world. Not to give our devotion, not to give our attention, our lives to the things of the world. But to God. Implicit in the command to love God is the command to be obedient to His will. John says in 1 John 1 verses 5 uh, through 7. That we, that God, in the latter part of the verse it says God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Therefore if we say we have fellowship with Him and we walk in darkness, we lie and do not know the truth. But if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Christ cleanses us of our sins. And a little later in verses 15 through 17 he says, therefore do not love the world. No, the things that are in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. For these are not of the Father but of the world. We must be holy people of God. We must maintain the purity of the church. There also remains the, uh, uh, the necessity of keeping ourselves free from the pollutants of the world. And it's a job doing that because we live in an immoral, corrupt world. I think it's even emphasized more since we have such uh, uh, emphasis upon media now. You've got the internet, you've got television, you've got movies, you've got music. And we just seem to inundate it with the influence of the world. We have to preserve 
that purity in this world as children of God. In 1 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, 9 through 11, there evidently was a problem with the church at Corinth as well. And he gives a, a warning, a definitive warning. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor uh, homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit to come of the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. That means that's supposed to be in the past. You were washed and sanctified. You're not to continue in that way any longer. We also see in Galatians, the fifth chapter, verses 19 and following, the Apostle Paul draws a contrast between those who walk after the flesh and identifying the works of the flesh that are characteristic of them. Then those who walk after the Spirit, guided by the teachings of Christ Jesus, here's the fruit of the Spirit that they bear. But notice verse 24, he says, those who are of Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. We're, we've died to that because now we're to walk indeed with the Lord. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 through 22, Peter emphasizes also the importance of our remaining distinctive for Christ Jesus, living for Him. Titus 2, verses 11 and 12, the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all men, instructing us, that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. The church is to keep itself pure, to strive for purity. Because we are the body of Christ. I think that's a very significant reference to the church, to the Lord's church. And it does have reference to the church in Ephesians 1, and 23. When Paul talks about Jesus, the head of the church, he says, which is his body. In Colossians 1, and verse 18, he's the head of the church, his body. And I think there's two reasons he emphasizes that. Because when, when Christians, of course, in 1 Corinthians 12 tells us, we're by one spirit, we're baptized in the body of Christ. We're added to his church. And he's emphasizing, obviously, the unity of Christ, of his children. They're his body. They're to be one. There are many members yet one body. And Jesus emphasized in his prayer to the Father that they may be one. But another emphasis, I think, is it shows the connection of the church with Christ Jesus. We are his body. And can you conceive any pollution being presented or connected to Jesus Christ? I'm his body. I'm to, to keep myself pure to his glory and to his honor and not to fall prey to the temptations of Satan. We need to conceive that that's what Jesus' intention of the church is. A beautiful passage in Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27. Paul says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify the church, having cleansed it with the washing of water with the blood, that he might present the church to himself, a glorious church, not having spot, not having wrinkle. We must preserve the purity. Also the very fact that the church is to be exemplary. We're to manifest holy living before the world. We're to show them this, what it means to be a child of God. Like Peter says in 1 Peter 3, when he writes a, a Christian uh, wife who, who has a non-Christian husband, he can't gain him by the word. He said, well, then gain him by your life. Live that godly, good chance life before him. Get his attention. Show him the difference it makes in your life. Paul in Romans, the second chapter, in verse 24, speaks of the Jews who by their hypocrisy and corruption in life, he says, you blaspheme the name of God before the Gentiles. We must not blaspheme the name of Christ before the world. We must keep ourselves pure for him. Jesus, in the classic passage of Matthew 5, verses 13 through 16, says, You're the salt of the earth, for the salt has lost its savor, since forth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden in the foot of men. You're a city set on a hill. You, you, you can't light a lamp and put it in a bushel, but on the lampstand that all may see it. And the emphasis as he brings out, he says, Therefore let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. And the good works there is the life of the Christian, bearing the fruit of the Spirit, living in accordance with his will, being moral, godly people. Let them see it, that God may be glorified. We emphasize, or the word of God emphasizes this so clear the emphasis of that. Paul says in Ephesians, the fifth chapter, in verse 8, he says, You were once darkness, but now you're light in Christ. Therefore, walk as children of light. A logical conclusion. We just walk as children of light. Unbelievers want us to turn off the light. We have many in our society who want an amoral society. No restraints, no requirements, no moral. Everything's all right. Everything's uh, godly. Or not godly, but acceptable. And so they want Christians to... Be quiet. They want to kill 
that light. Peter emphasized that's always with being in 1 Peter uh, 4 and verse 4 when he says they don't understand why we don't run in their flood of disability. And so he speaks evil against us. We must be godly people. We must not let our light go out. I'd like to read with you Ephesians, the fifth chapter, uh, beginning in verse 3, and really going on down verse 10. I see Peter, uh, rather Paul, emphasized this. He says, For fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, that covetous man, who is an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. And let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the Spirit is all goodness, righteousness, and truth, is approving what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. We must not let our light stop shining for the cause of Christ. We must strive to keep the church pure and not fall into the ways of immorality of the world around us. And it's a responsibility of us, each of Christians to do this. And it's, it's a, a diligent war that we fight and it is a war a war of souls a war to pleasing to God we must be diligent about being righteous before God we must be also cautious because we live in a world where Satan has traps for us and he's clever he's powerful he's deceptive Peter said in 1 Peter 5 verse 8 be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil walks about seeking who may devour all the words in there are important he said we're to be sober we're to take this serious this is not a game we're to be vigilant. We must always be cautious and ready or lest we fall. Because our adversary, our enemy who hates you, despises you, wants you to suffer eternally in hell, is like a roaring lion. A lion roars when he's hungry. When he's on the prey, he is stalking you. You must be sober. You must be vigilant that you might live righteous before God. 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, in verse 12. Paul emphasizes how important it is that we, we preserve our thinking. We need to bring our thoughts into captivity for, for obedience to Christ. We must maintain control over our minds, as emphasized. Matthew 15, verse 19, Jesus also makes a great statement here. And he talks about how important that if we're going to live the Christian life, if we're going to be pure, if we're going to be holy, we have to begin with our hearts and our minds. It's not just outward action. And Jesus says, For out of the heart proceeds the thoughts of uh, 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 evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man. We have to begin with our thoughts. A Christian has no right to look at pornography. He, has, he needs to guard himself from which watching uh, movies that are suggestive and that are filthy and listening to music that is the same, watching programming that is the same, putting yourself in the situations where you have that influence. We have antivirus programs that keep our computers from crashing. Well, we need to have an antivirus program to keep those evil thoughts from, from starting to direct our attention and thinking and how we're going to think about things. I remember uh, in a youth camp at Roberts Cave Youth Camp, I direct that camp, and uh, one of the evening devotionals, a counselor uh, wanted to make an acknowledgment of sin. He had used an expletive during the class, and he was apologizing for it. And he gave this explanation. He said, I know I shouldn't have done it, but last night I was watching a movie that had a lot of filthy language in it, and that was on my mind. Filth influences, garbage in, garbage out. We need to be careful about how we think. Paul says, James says in James 1, 13 through 15, that no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, because God cannot be tempted, nor does he tempt any man. But each man is drawn away. He is tempted when he is drawn away by his own lust. By his own lust. It begins within the heart. That's the incipiency. That's the initiating part of it. So we want to be pure. We have to fight on what, how we think. We have to guard what is influencing our thinking. But it's also emphasized, Paul, Philippians 4 and verse 8, he says we need to meditate on the things that are pure and holy and godly. Paul and Colossians, the third chapter, set your mind on things that are above and not on things upon the earth. In 2 Corinthians 10, 14, 4 and 5, rather, he says we're to bring uh, all of our, our thoughts in to the captivity, to the obedience of Christ. This is where the battle's fought. 
but we also need to maintain control over our bodies. We need to take responsibility for our actions. So many people blame, well, I couldn't help it because. You know, someone did this, someone influenced me. A number of years ago, Flip, I guess I used Flip Wilson, I'll age myself. But Flip Wilson had a saying, he says, the devil made me do it. Well, that's funny in a comedy skit, but there's no truth to it. The devil doesn't make you do anything. You choose to yield to his way. And so we need to maintain discipline and take the responsibility of maintaining that discipline. In Ephesians, not Ephesians, but Romans, the third, sixth chapter, verses 13 and 14. And the apostle he emphasizes, he says that whereas we once gave our members to serve sin, now we give our members to serve God, to live in righteousness before him. Paul rebukes the church at Thessalonica, 1 Thessalonians 4, uh, verses 4 and 5, where there were some who obviously engaged in fornication. He says, you need to control your own vessel. Take charge. And then there's the words of Paul, and I admire this because Paul, is, to me, is a hero, a godly preacher who's sacrificed and, and who has such faith in God, but he saw as a necessity, I have to take control and resist temptation and sin. He says, I buffet my body and bring it to bud, and after other, I'm preaching to others, I might come a castaway. We need to guard and be cautious about this. Paul emphasizes how important it is also to be vigilant. In 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter, uh, where he says that uh, as he talks to Israel, uh, where the church about Israel, how many who left the land of uh, Egypt were on the way to, to Canaan, to the land of promise, that all of those who were 20 years of age and older fell. They didn't make it except for two, Joshua and Caleb. And he says, we learn from that. You've been baptized in the Christ. You have the hope of eternal life, but you have the journey you have to complete. And then he gives in, verse, in, in that passage, he says, let him that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. I've been preaching, I guess, for 46, 47 years, and I've been shocked through the years when I've learned about some brother or sister in Christ that was so strong, have gone back to the world. And they were Christians, and they were faithful, but they let their guard down. They thought, they, I, I can play with temptations. I won't fall. I've been a Christian too many years, or I'm too dedicated, or whatever it may be. Brethren, all of us are subject to falling. We must not think we won't fall. We must always be on guard to live our uh, life for Christ Jesus. And we also must present and propagate and advance the teachings of Christ dealing with moral issues as well. One of the classes I teach is Christian ethics, and as we deal with different moral topics, it has been surprising over the years when I have a student come up, you know, I've never heard a lesson on abortion. I've never heard a lesson on drinking. I've never heard a lesson on divorce and remarriage. I haven't heard lessons dealing with morality because that's kind of a taboo topic. You're going to upset someone. That shouldn't be because as we have seen, the passages that are before us tell us that we need to be conscious and concerned about keeping the church pure, and you can't do that unless you teach the truth. Truth error can be advanced not only by teaching false teachings but by not teaching the truth on the matter. That's what Paul was emphasizing you don't need to do with the church in, at uh, uh, Corinth. Is if you don't do this, this thing's going to spread to them. So we need to be concerned about teaching the truth. And we live a society today that uses the term negative preaching. First time I heard that, I didn't have a slice idea. And so you're preaching negative. I said, and you need to stop that. And what do you mean? Well, I don't know. <laughs> Well, how am I going to stop something you don't know? And, and basically, out of the years, I found out if it's something that is rebuking, it's something that challenges you, something that makes you think you have to change and you have to grow and do something besides just feeling really comfortable and happy with yourself, that's negative preaching. But the gospel tells us that we have to challenge because we have to walk in the way of righteousness. And so we listen to the rebukes and teachings. There are many who would quiet, but we must not be quiet. We must proclaim. Our responsibility is to teach the whole counsel of God. In Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verses 11 and 12, as Paul talks about the miraculous gifts that's delivering to us the, the message of God and the purpose of it, we're to build up the church. We're going to help it grow spiritually, grow more Christ-like in our lives. We need to teach the truth and support the teaching of the truth. Would uh, anyone in error come out of error if he's never rebuked? Of course not. 
You can't love someone out of sin and nothing else. If we just love them, make them think everything is great and wonderful, we may even encourage them to continue in the sin because that's wrong. No one thinks it's wrong. Would the man who had his father's wife have repented without that needed rebuke? No, Paul says you need to turn him over to Satan. And you read about the letters of Paul, you read through his letters, you see many times he's rebuking and exhorting and challenging. And he says in Colossians 2 and verse 4 that his letters are, are 4 verse 16 rather, his letters to be read among the churches along with the other letters. Can you imagine the one who's reading the letter editing out all the things that brethren consider negative? It really shortened the list, wouldn't it? The letter is to be read and we're to proclaim the whole counsel of God. Paul even gives us a warning in 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5. And uh, students in school of preaching probably heard this verse more than anyone else. But he, God gives us a charge through Paul. He charges us before God in Christ Jesus, who's just the living and the dead, and he's coming in at his kingdom. Preach the word. Be urgent in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when men not endure the sound doctrine, but having itching ears will heat themselves, teaches after their own lust. But you fulfill your ministry. You do the work of an evangelist, an evangelizer, a gospel proclaimer. Includes the teachings of God's word. We need to take inventory of ourselves, therefore. We, we can talk about how we have maintained the purity of the church, but we need to make sure we're not part of the problem. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, to examine yourself whether you're in the faith. Examine yourself. What about your thoughts day after day? What do you think about? What kind of thoughts do you lie uh, in your mind? How do you expose yourself to things that are unsavory? We need to consider how we, well, we do not conform to the world. How much like the world am I? Or if I am, what do I need to do about it? We need to be concerned how we represent Christ to the world. We're, we're to be in examples. We're, we're to manifest godliness and righteousness. How well am I doing that in how I live? And do we really support the preaching of the gospel with all of its truth? Do we stand behind those who would proclaim its message? And do we do that? When we hear someone, for instance, talking about abortion, do we just be quiet? Or do we have the courage to say, you know, that's murdering a baby? Or when someone talks about drinking or gambling or anything that's immoral, do we just be quiet because we, don't, we feel intimidated? Or are we willing to expose that as sin and harmful for the soul? The purity of the church is important. It's a very important aspect of its identity. In the book of Revelation, chapter 1 and on going to chapter 3, we have Jesus pictured in a beautiful way as, as standing in the midst of the seven lampstands. Of course, seven is a number for perfection. It seems to represent all of God's congregation, all of God's people. He's in the midst of the lampstand. He has fellowship with them. He watches and cares for them. But in the letters, he warns them, your lamp can be removed. If we lose that identity as God's people, and moral impurity is the way you lose your identity as God's people, our lampstand can be removed. We need to strive for purity in the church because we are a holy people of God, and we need to assume that responsibility. Thank you for your kind attention. Brother Charles, thank you for 